Look, it's dark. All of a sudden now, in this text adventure, I couldn't see anything. And I got scared. I know I'm sitting at my computer in my bedroom. I can turn my computer off and go to bed anytime I want. But now all of a sudden in this game, I started worrying. I just got my character lost. Well, it's interesting, this particular game, there's a little line that you could type to, you could do a, a text to, uh, or an instant message to a friend. So I instant messaged him. I said, hey, I'm lost. He said, where are you at? So I said, well, I'm kind of in this area because I think I know where you're at. And he made his way from wherever he was at in this, in this cyber world, which is just a text, you know, a text file, all the way to where I was at, come down into this hole with his flashlight, found me, and took me out. All this by just typing words, left, right, left, right. You know what? You can get really tired of typing all the time. You can get really tired of not knowing where you're at. I was going to put an actual map of this world, but uh, it, they, it was just too complicated. Just understand that, that this game scared me from text adventures for a long time because I just didn't understand them. I got to the point where I just didn't want to get lost anymore. I didn't want to get overwhelmed anymore. I didn't want somebody to come and rescue me anymore. So I just set this game aside for many, many months until I said, okay, I'm going to try it again. You know, it's interesting. I got to thinking about that as I was looking at this scripture that we're going to talk about today, thinking about the theme of it, that this is a lot like Christianity. I think sometimes in Christianity, we just want to have, have this polished, surface, beautiful look of what Christianity might be, but we forget that there's so much more there, that there's so much more available, that we can... I have so many more adventures. And when I started getting into this game, further and further and further, I started seeing just how interesting it was and intricate it was. That's how Christianity become to me. I started realizing that there is far more than meets the eye in my Christianity. Now, we've been going through the book of Romans. And we've talked about several different themes. I know I hit one of these buttons and it worked. I'm going to try this again. Enter. Am I cheated? I made it wider. Let's undo that. Let's not undo that. Menu. I hit a button and it worked one time. All right, go ahead and go to the next. Just keep up. I'm just saying. Um, Christianity isn't much different. And, I, and what I want to do is I want to help you to catch some of the excitement that I have in uh, interacting with Christianity in general and with the Word of God specifically. And I want to do today, I want to show you how I think that this is supposed to happen. The first thing I'm going to say is that Romans, the book of Romans, has a plan. It has a purpose. There's a reason why Paul wrote this book. So up to this point, we've talked about two things. First thing that we've talked about is the idea that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we talked about that in the, in the reference that this applies to everybody. Paul says, all have sinned. Now, a good friend of mine, in fact, he wished my wife a happy birthday this weekend. Tomorrow's her birthday. Roy Halberg, he's a pastor in California, said, all means all, and that's all all means. So understand that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This categorically includes everybody. In fact, if you looked at, look at the context of this particular verse, you would say that means Jews and Gentiles. Well, that's everybody. I would say that specifically what Paul is telling us in writing this message or in writing this book is when he says all have sinned, he's saying even the Jews have sinned and Gentiles. And not only have both Jews and Gentiles sinned, but both Jews and Gentiles are subject to the ability to believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. Everybody can be saved, Paul is saying. All have sinned, all can be saved in the, uh, in the idea of God. The Romans, as a genetic group or an ethnic group, were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. You understand, there's Jews and then there's everybody else. A little bit later on, Paul says there's Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God as if we're kind of different than everybody else. And 
I think Peter even calls us a peculiar people. I looked in the mirror today and I agreed. Um, But, be that as it may, the Romans were Gentiles. They weren't Greek necessarily, but they were Gentiles. And so here he's telling a group of Gentiles something about themselves and something about the other ethnic group, the Jews, that maybe they didn't fully understand. Everybody's a sinner. Just like you, Paul is saying, the Jews are sinners too, and just like you, they too can become Christians. That's what he's saying in the first part, or in the, as a first theme of the book of Romans. Maybe the Romans had something against the Jews. I don't know. They had a thing. Maybe they uh, worried that because the Jews killed the Son of God, that God didn't want to save them. Maybe it's just basic uh, anti-Semitism that it seems to run rampant in our world. Maybe they thought that God, uh, God's rejection of them was permanent rejection and that they couldn't be saved because they would never come to know him. I don't know, but I have the impression that, the, that Paul is telling us in the book of Romans that the Romans were not to look down on the Jews because of whatever reason, because just like them, just like the Romans, the Jews needed Jesus. Just like the Romans, the Jews need a savior. The second thing, and if you want to hit the button there, the second thing is that eternal life doesn't start at death. If you remember, we talked about this. This was the first thing that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It starts at conversion. And this has implications, and we talked about at least two implications, and I'm trying to bring together the three messages, right, so that you see kind of Romans as a whole. But there was at least two things we talked about, um, a a couple of things that we talked about in that first message, but I want to add one today, that Romans 1 has a very strong moral language to it, or I would say actually immoral language or a, a immoral tone to it. And then when I take Romans chapter 1 and the strong immoral tone there and add that to that question that we talked about the first week, what shall we say then? Shall we uh, continue in sin that grace might increase? I have to ask the question, what, what is Paul talking about? What is Paul trying to get across to the Romans? I have a feeling, I can't confirm this, but I have a feeling that maybe the Romans were trying to justify some immoral lifestyle that they had. Remember, immediately upon introduction, he starts hitting on the Romans saying that uh, this moral type of lifestyle is a punishment from God. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. And then it goes on to, and God gave them over. Three things that God gave them over to. And then at the very end of verse of chapter 1, he talks about, and they quit even acknowledging God. And then he goes through a, a period of a period of things that he talks about. And then Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says, shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? I have to ask the question, were the Romans living some sort of immoral life that Paul was worried about? He says, listen, guys, you worry about the Jews being unsavable. Look at your own lifestyle. Now, of course, his answer to that question was, God forbid, if you have the King James, may it never be, or whatever other strong word of of denial that you have. And, And as I read that very strong denial, I get the sense that Paul is abhorred at the possibility. He's abhorred that an immoral life is the path to righteousness, And I think that maybe the Romans were following down that path. I don't know. Again, I get that impression. But the book of Romans has a third theme. Those were the two messages that we talked about already. The book of Romans has a third theme, the plan of salvation. And this is where we're going to pick up today. But this is only as an introduction because we want to get into a scripture passage. Now, this plan is very simple, and if you're familiar with the Romans' road, that's exactly what this is. This plan of salvation is, number one, everyone needs salvation because we have all sinned. We've already talked about this passage. Go ahead and hit your button. There is none righteous, no, not one, we read in in Romans chapter 3. And then Romans chapter 3 closes with, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
Everybody needs salvation. Nobody is righteous. We're all under condemnation and judgment. Number two, there's a price or a consequence for sin. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. We're all subject to this wage. We all have to pay the piper. We can't go through this life without knowing or without realizing or without fearing the fact that somewhere along the line we have to answer a question. What have you done for me? Maybe some people might think. Whatever, but the wages of sin is death, and those wages are coming due for many of us. We're very, very close to that time where we're going to have to pay the check. We went to one of our favorite restaurants night before last. Eventually, after you eat a fine meal, guess what comes? The check, right? Some years ago, I had a hospital stay for a, for a, um, a kidney stone. And, of course, you go through the hospital and you answer all their questions, but something follows every hospital stay, and that's called the bill. And so this bill added up to $52,000 for me. No insurance, no help, no nothing. So we called the hospital and said, what can we do? And they said, just be patient. We've applied for some charities to see if somebody would pay. $52,000 for a kidney stone extraction. Oh my. We were, and I worked for maybe uh, uh, four or $500 a week at the time. This was back in the early 90s in Vancouver, Washington. The third thing about the plan of salvation is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Remember, that bill is coming due, right? That bill is coming due, and we're going to have to pay it. But Jesus says, I know that they can't afford to pay this. They can't afford to pay it on their own. How can, a, how can a sinner pay for his sins? It takes a sinless person to pay the price for somebody who is sinful. Now, if I'm poor, I can't pay the, the check. Somebody else that's rich has to come and pay my bill, right? So here I am. Poor in spirit. Remember Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they shall be what? Uh, say that louder. Say it, Charlene. Uh-oh, she's not remembering. But Exactly. Think about that. If we're poor in spirit, we have no money spiritual money to pay our way. We can't pay the wages for our sin, so Jesus says, I'll take care of this. I've got this one. In fact, what happens is, as the perfect human being, he can pay my way, right? And as a perfect human being, God-man, not only can he pay his way and my way, but he can pay everybody's way. That's why Jesus had to be God, because a death of a man is good for a man, but the but the sacrifice of a deity, of a God, of God, not a God, sorry. Ah! Get rid of that out of my recording. But think about that. It took God's sacrifice to pay for everybody's sin, which means there are no limits, right? Everybody's sin has been paid for. Number three, oh, Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ignore the question mark. That was my... Probably my pinky hitting a wrong button. Number four, we receive salvation and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ and through him alone. Acts says there is no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved but by Jesus Christ. Romans tells us that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you know what, I typed very fast this morning. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Silly me. <laughs> I will correct that eventually. But see, that's, that's the plan, right? We have this need that we can't pay, so Jesus comes and pays it. And the amazing thing is that we didn't even ask for it. Remember what Isaiah says? This is a, a, an obstinate people who are not even looking for me. They're eating their pork and they're eating out of bad, out of bed with bad utensils and they're telling other people, we're too righteous for you. They didn't even care about God. And that was the Jews who were rejecting God, much less rejecting Jesus. 
The fifth part of the plan of salvation out of the Roman, based on the Romans road is that salvation through Jesus Christ brings us that relationship of peace with God and peace with other people. I didn't put down Romans 5.1, I just quoted quickly Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing thing. Remember, the Jews were being persecuted by the Romans. The Romans were saying, listen, they killed Jesus. They can't be saved or whatever, right? And Paul, after this whole long thing about even you are bad in God's eyes, says, if you accept Jesus as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, there's now no, no, no more condemnation. That applies to the Jews. It applies to us, and that's for the Jews also. We are not under judgment anymore. That's the plan of salvation in a nutshell. Now, I don't know what you've done with that plan in your life. I don't know if you have answered this question that God has posed to you uh, as of yet. Maybe you haven't. Maybe this is new to you, or maybe it's clicking for you. I don't know. But if this is something new, let me know afterwards, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Talk to Pastor Roland when he comes back, or somebody else that you know has, has responded to this particular message. This really is a simple plan. There's not a lot of complication here. We are in need. We can't fill that need. God can fill that need. And he did so. He came to us. We didn't go to him. Remember what I said last week? I think it was last week. Religion is us seeking for God. The gospel is God seeking for us, seeking us. The plan is simple, but it's also awe-inspiring. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Paul clearly, and I'm going to demonstrate this, Paul clearly shows in chapters 9 through 11 that the Jews still have a future. Remember in Isaiah we read, they're bad people. They're not even looking for God. But Paul tells us that in the economy of God, in the plan of God, they still have a future as a nation. In fact, there has always been a special group or a special place in God's heart for the Jews. He chose them. He specifically went out of his way and found them. Now, if we say that they're now not chosen, we have to say one of two things about God. That he either made a mistake in choosing them, that's his omniscience, because he didn't know that they were going to fall and he just made a mistake, or he was not sovereign enough, powerful enough to keep them. But I don't think either of those are true of our God. He chose Israel... And he's powerful enough to keep Israel. Israel may step off the path every now and then, sometimes in great and mighty ways, sometimes in, a, in, in very dramatic ways, but that doesn't change that God is still sovereign and still has this people chosen. God might not be happy with Israel, but God is still in love with his chosen people. That's chapter 9, if you want to hit, the, hit that, and you can read through that, that Israel still has a future. Chapter 10, we see that Israel has rejected the gospel. So here we have a group of people that God has chosen and God is still in love with, but they've rejected the gospel and the Messiah that the gospel says. In fact, Israel is still in rejection of the Messiah. Israel seeks their own righteousness. They say we can do this according to the rules that we've set up, 613 of them. And as a result, in chapter 10, verse 21, they still stand under God's judgment for his rejection, for their rejection. But the plan still is there's a remnant. That's chapter 11. Just like he said to Isaiah, and I'm I'm encapsulating 9, 10, and 11 for you, so you see what's going on here. Early on in chapter 11, God says through Paul that there's a remnant. Just like when Elijah 
stood up on Mount Carmel and battled those hundreds and hundreds of priests of Baal and Ashtaroth. And fire came down and consumed them and, and consumed this, with this drenched altar. And then after this great and mighty work that, Isaiah, or that, that Elijah was part of, he went down off the mountain and he cried, God, I'm alone. And God says, you're not alone. There is a remnant. There always has been a remnant. There will always be a remnant. And that's true even in Paul's time. That's true even in our time. There always has been, always will be a remnant of Israel who believes. And so Paul is telling us, listen, it's not over until it's over. I'm not going to say it's not over until the fat guy sings, because I'm not going to sing anymore today. Well, wait a minute. I think there's another song. I just uh, was wrong. So now we have the problem. Israel has rejected God. God is still in love with Israel. What do we do? This is the plan. Now the plan for us, of course, is to accept Jesus as our Savior. But that's the same plan for Israel. In fact, Isaiah, or, 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 or uh, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that's right in the middle of the passage about who Israel is and what they need to do to accept Messiah. That's not aimed at us as Gentiles. That's aimed at the Jews in, re- in accepting their uh, beloved Messiah. God's plan is this. He chose Israel to be his people. They rejected him and his son. And as a result, and this is the rest of Isaiah, or Romans chapter 11, he ungrafted them from the tree. The tree is Abraham, the root of Abraham. And so here is Israel growing off of this beautiful tree, this, this cultured, cultivated tree. Well, they rejected God. So he said, fine, I'll ungraft you. And he set them aside. And then he took a wild branch of olives from a wild tree and grafted it into Israel. That's us. That's the imagery of Romans chapter 11. The Gentiles were taken from a wild olive tree, grafted into the cultivated tree. This is something that Israel was supposed to do. Israel was supposed to reach out of her little cocoon, her little righteous cocoon, out into the nations and draw the nations into a relationship with Yahweh God. But they failed to do that. And so God said, fine, I will just set you aside for a minute. I will bring the Gentiles in. And guess what? There's still a place for you. That's the rest of Romans 11. The Gentiles were taken from this wild olive tree, grafted into the cultivated tree. Um, But what didn't happen is that those branches that were removed, Israel, right, the, the proper branches, were never destroyed. It never says that in this particular passage. They were never burned. They were never cut up. They were never thrown away. They were just set aside for a minute. In fact, the the passage clearly says that they're waiting right now. It's waiting to be regrafted back into that tree. And that was the amazing thing for me in Romans 11, is that the grafting into the tree was not us. It was Israel. God is ready to put Israel back into the root of Abraham or Abraham's seed and say, you're mine again. He's just waiting for Israel to accept him and his plan. The branches that were removed from the tree were never thrown away. Israel was to draw the Gentile nations to relationship with God, but actually only was able to impose the religious rules on them. They were taken off. But if they come to accept the gospel, they would be regrafted back into the tree. Here's the nutshell. The Messiah came to Israel. Israel rejected him. They were removed from the tree, and the Gentiles, that's the Romans, right, and us, were grafted into that tree. And why did we get a chance to be part of the kingdom of God? Turn to Romans chapter 11, please, because this is where it gets very fast. If you think that it's been fast so far... Hold on to your Bibles. Romans chapter 11. Look in verse 1. I say then, well, actually, go to verse 11. Because that's where we need to start. I say then, they did not stumble as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles... Why? To make them 
jealous. That's the plan. We are part of the grand plan of God to win back his chosen nation. We are part of the grand plan of God to woo back his chosen bride, Israel, into his body. We're part of the grand plan of God to fulfill everything he ever wanted to fulfill through his chosen people. We're not replacement for Israel. We're to be added on with Israel into the family of faith. We were, they were not thrown away and burned. They were God's chosen people and just like us in need of a savior. Therefore, Paul says in Romans 10, 9, and 12, 9 through 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all. That's the plan. And it proves that God is faithful. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, for the gifts, and I think there might be uh, slides for these scriptures. There's, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. That gift and calling of God, that's Israel. That's not our gifts. That's Israel. God called Israel out of the world, and that has never been revoked. That is still in force. But it is true of us, isn't it? As people who were grafted into the Abrahamic tree, the family of faith, we now have a calling. And we now have gifts. And we now are called chosen of God. We look in Romans and we see that early in the book of Romans. All those things that were true of Israel are now true of us also. We partner now, at least we should be partner now with Israel, if she ever chose to allow herself to be grafted back into the tree. Let me say this. If God has this elaborate plan to keep Israel safe, what does he go through for us as his New Testament believers? We might think that the only response to the plan of salvation is believing or trusting in Christ. Remember, we talked about trust, right? And this truly is our response to the plan, but only initially. And but of course daily in the sense that this is the strength that we have to live in a very dark world. But it's uh, more than that. The interaction that I have with Romans tells me that the response to the plan is more than just believing or trusting. It is coming to a God who loves his people so much that I can only stand in awe. And that brings us to the last few verses of the book of Romans, of, of Romans 11. And that's really where I'm going to spend the next few minutes. Let me read this. Oh, the depths, or the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, that it might be paid back to him again? For bought from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now this amazing doxology stands at the tail end of Paul telling us that God's desire is to win his nation back, Israel. And he says that this plan has caused him to stand in awe and exclaim these great glories about who his God and our God is. That God would be so much in love with Israel that he would go to great lengths to win her back. And I have to say to myself, I have to say in front of you to myself that when we look at the plan, we stand in awe for at least a couple of reasons. Number one, because it's gracious in its scope. Go ahead and do the slide. Verse 33 says, Oh, the depths, or the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable is his ways. I see the awesomeness of God in at least three things here. And if you look at it, Paul outlines the whole plan in these few verses when he says that the breadth of God's plan is so great 
that not even the oceans can touch it. Look at the words that he uses. Number one, he says the depths of the riches. Go ahead and click. This is the idea, and you can click again, of divine wealth. Remember that rich guy that comes and pays my bill? You know that $52,000 bill I told you about? The hospital said, no, no, no. Wait, because we called the hospital. How do, we, how do we fix this, right? We can pay $50 a month or $25 or whatever it was that we offered to pay. They said, no, it's not been enough time. There's been some charities that are interested in helping to pay. So we get a couple of little letters saying, yeah, we paid you know, $800. or we paid, Remember, $52,000. We paid uh, $100 or we there. We got two or three of these kind of letters, and we're thinking, okay, that we got some paid, you know, there's maybe, you know, $2,000 paid, so we call the hospital back. Now, we're talking over a period of like three months. And they said, no, it's not been enough time. Give it time. Eventually, not too many more weeks after that, we get another envelope in the mail. And we open the envelope, and it said, your 52, now $50,000 bill, stamped, believe it or not, paid in full. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. That's the Greek word tetelestai. And this Greek word tetelestai is a financial term, as many of the terms in the Bible are, either agricultural or financial. And that Greek term tetelestai is what a, is what a bill collector would, would stamp on the bill in Greek, pay, excuse me, Paid in full. When Jesus says it is finished, he's saying it's done. It's paid. It's over with. Remember, the wages of sin is death. I can't afford those wages. Jesus says, boom, paid in full. God or Paul is here reflecting that when he says the depths of the riches of God's, uh, of God's wisdom and knowledge. Everything that we need is enveloped in who God is, the depths of the riches, divine wealth. It's enough to pay for your salvation and mine. Now we have a ticket, right? We don't have a bill anymore. Now we have a pass that we take to the pearly gates, if you're so inclined to think that way. And when God says, why should I let you, let you into my heaven? He'll say, because Jesus paid my way. That's your answer. Not because, well, I did good things. I'm a good guy. I went to church every day. I gave $20 every week uh, in the offering basket. I help people across the street. Those things don't help. There's no points for sitting in the pew here with God. The only points that you earn with God is trusting in Him and saying, you know better than me, God. That's the plan. The depth of the riches. Number two, it says that uh, his ways, his judgments are unsearchable. This is the idea of inscrutable, right? If you've ever heard that word, inscrutable. Now, I don't know, I had to look that word up, but here's how it looks to me. A good way to think about inscrutable, and if you hit the button again, means to consider cats and dogs. Well, my interaction with cats and dogs this week is my wife had allergy testing, and we now found out that she's allergic to our three cats. But she's not allergic to dogs. My answer to dogs has consistently been what again? No. No. Well, I guess we're probably going to go to the dog, uh, dog way, so I don't know. We'll see. Uh, how about a, like a big dog? I don't know. But this, uh, here, think about cats and dogs when you think about the word inscrutable. Dogs wear their hearts on their sleeves, right? When they're happy, right? When they're sad, when they're tired, when they're eating, they do everything with gusto. There is no guessing what that dog is thinking or feeling. But what about a cat? Have you ever guessed if your cat is happy? Your cat looks at you and says, pet me, but not right now. My cat sits there and goes, meow. I'm like, what do you want? Meow. Food? Meow. I don't get it. Help me out. Well, yeah, I told you we have three cats. 
I'm walking down the stairs into our basement, and one of our cats just wouldn't get off the stairs. So here we go. I'd finally, I'd, I'd like help him get down to the next step, and he'd plant there. Come on, let me down. She was at the foot of the stairs yesterday, just, and this cat wouldn't move. But see, isn't that the way cat? You can pet a cat all day long if they want you to, right? Have you ever heard of cats? You can have a dog obey you and go from place to place and do what it is that you want. I have never heard of a search cat, right? We're part of a search team. We have search dogs, right? But there's no such thing as a search cat. You just can't get them. That's inscrutable. Dogs are not inscrutable, right? You know what's going on. But when the Bible says that God's judgments are inscrutable, it means that we're just not going to grab a hold of it. And these aren't bad judgments. This is the good stuff. This is his ability to make good, fair, and firm decisions. We don't have that. We can't get into the mind of God and say, now why did he say that? Unless he tells us. The third thing that it says is it's unfathomable. I had a little trouble with this one. The translators kind of wavered back and forth from like untrackable, untraceable. You can't, you can't. Or, you know, it, when you go deer hunting and you, and you uh, 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 shoot a deer and you have to track it through the woods, you can't do that with this kind of information. The kind of stuff that we're talking about, God, you can't trace. I kind of looked at it like this. You can't, and this again, this is a computer thing, you can't reverse engineer God. You can't, you can't take God down to his constituent parts and say, I can make that. I can duplicate that. We can't do that with God. That's kind of the idea here as I understand it. 1 Peter 1.12 says, It was revealed to them, the angels, that they were not serving themselves but you in these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which the angels long to look. They just don't get it. And if angels don't get it, unless God tells me what's going on, I'm lost. But see, he has chosen to tell us, hasn't he? So it's very gracious in its scope. God has all this available to him that we wouldn't even be able to tap into or understand except that he come down to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But the second thing is that it's grandeur and it's, it's the grandeur of its scope. Go ahead and hit the button. This is verse 34 and 35. And these are some quotations from a couple of Old Testament books. Listen to this. For who has known the mind of the Lord who, is, who became his counselor? Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? I really only have two things to say about this. Number one, God didn't learn this plan from somebody else. You can hit the button. God didn't get this from somebody. This is all him. The second thing that I would say is that he doesn't owe anybody anything. Somebody didn't come to God and says, hey, I got an idea. Oh, that's a good idea, God said. Here, let me help, you know, let me pay you for your idea. God doesn't owe any man anything. That's what this is saying. God said, God developed this plan completely in himself, and he completely executed it himself. We get that. There's nobody that helped God with this plan of salvation. There's nobody that helped God in executing it. We're not helping God win Israel back. We're part of the plan, but we're not helping. God doesn't owe us anything in helping him win his people back. What happens is we become part of his people. We're not Israel. Don't misunderstand me. He has some differences in his plan for each one of us. But the basic idea is, is that we're not his partner. We're his servants. It's all him. And that brings us to our third point and the final point. It's glorious in its goal. Verse 36 says, For from him and through him and to him, are all things. To him be the glory. Amen. 
If we want an overall theme of Romans, here it is. God is completely self-contained and self-sufficient. He needs no one. He is the source, he's the medium, and he's the goal of everything. As John MacArthur says, he's the beginning, the middle, and the end of it all. This is more than just the final phrase of a doxology. This is the point. Everything that we have as Christians, everything that we do, everything that we've gained is because God has given it to us. And so when Paul says, I stand in awe of who he is, it's because he sees this. He sees that God went out of his way for Paul and for me and for you. He sees that God has a majestic, wonderful, gracious plan that includes his rebellious and obstinate people, the Jews. And he says, thank you, God, for saving my people, my fellow Israelites. This is our response to salvation. To God be the glory. Nothing else, nothing less. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. I think I have it up there. But God, being rich in his mercy, because of his great love which, with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. And here it is, so that, that's purpose statement, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God's goal is his glory. He wants to be able to, you know what? If you have a wallet, look in your wallet. You probably got a picture of your kids or your grandkids or your wife. Look at your refrigerator, especially as you were raising your kids. What was on your refrigerator? Those really awful drawings that your kids put out that you were so proud of. Remember the music man, right? Music man, the guy comes into town and he's selling uniforms and musical instruments and a method of learning called the think system. He says, if you can whistle, you can play a tune. And everybody's all up in arms that he's scamming them. But when they first start playing the tunes, right at the very end of the movie, the trumpet player is playing his horrible whatever song it was. And you hear in the audience, that's my Johnny. I don't understand it. It was horrible. But parents are proud of their kids. Amen. God is proud of his children. And he wants to show us off to everything that has ever been created. See, this is my people. That's his goal. It's his glory. It's his kindness that he's showing off. And guess what? We're the recipients of that. And Jesus or uh, Paul stands in awe of that plan. Israel's part of that plan. Israel hasn't been set aside. Israel is still part of God's plan. Our salvation and eternal life isn't the sole purpose of God's work of redemption. And if we think so, we miss the biggest part of God's plan, His glory. We fall back into the sins of the Israelites and state that, uh, and state that we were in before we were saved. That's self-centeredness. When we think it's about us, we miss it. We're just right back where we started, being selfish. We think that it's all about us. We are more than tools in the plan. We were made in the likeness and image of God for a purpose, but that's not the point. God is the point. Don't lose sight of what's, an important, of what's important. Don't focus so much here. Focus here. Job, the book of Job. Job had some calamity come upon him. He wasn't a bad guy. He was a fairly good guy. And his three friends, I would say three and a half friends, because it's kind of hard to tell about uh, the last guy, right? Is he a friend? Is he not a friend? I say friends facetiously, right? 
But they kept telling him, you did something, Job. You sinned. You did something. God's mad at you and he's punishing you. He's like, I can't think of anything. And through this whole book, all these 40 chapters, they keep telling him, think it through, Job. You'll figure it out. And he's thinking it. He's saying, God, I don't understand. I'm not doing anything. And he finally says, I get it. I get it. Woohoo! The point of Job. I'm a nobody. I'm a worm. I'm this big. Right? This is Job saying this. You can go to Job and see this. I'm just a minuscule dust on the back of a flea. I'm nothing. And God says, you still don't get it. It's not about you. It's not about how little you are or how worthless you are or how needful you are or anything about you. It's about me. It's about God. And Job had to do a complete 180 degree turn. You want the point of Job? See God. That's the point. The Bible starts in the beginning, God. The Bible ends with the God. Everything is about him. Do we stand in awe of who he is and what he's done to show himself to us? Or do we look at ourselves so much, whether good or bad, that we lose sight of reality? Please stand in awe with me before our God. And you can stand as we sing a final hymn. We all know this hymn, verses 1 and 4 of Amazing Grace. Stand, if you would, as we prepare to sing this song. And if you need a hymn number, it's hymn 236. And we're going to sing verses 1 